My name is Scott Matheny. I'm the university chaplain. I've had the joy of being at this place, this joyous, amazing institution for 25 years. And I bring you greetings from our president, Dr. Troy Van Aken, who is taking care of one of our students. We in this institution have a long history, over 150 years. And in that time, we have tried to fashion a place where young people, faculty, staff, the community at large, recognize some of our history, who we are, and what our hopes are. In that hoping, there is always a question of what kind of a society are we working and living in. And in that notion of a society, we take and bring young men and women in and send them out with a degree that is strong and powerful to make a stand in the world. And so, in December, as I was going to get milk at an ungodly hour in the morning to get ready for a student gathering that night, just a few months ago on National Public Radio, it was announced that two women, sisters, had been convicted of activities in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. These two women, one lives in Chicago and one lives in Elmhurst. And I paused driving and collected myself and thought and initially, and I've been challenged and corrected, totally fine, I bet they go to church on Sunday. And then I said, what am I doing as the chaplain to help my student community, this amazing folk. I want them to organize. I want them to vote. I want them to be a part of demonstrations. But I don't want them in January 6th. What am I doing? What are the faculty doing? What is the president, the board of trustees? What are we doing to help care for and think more clearly about the issues. And Christian nationalism, as you know, has many sides and faces. And especially in the Chicago area, we know that there are large groups organized around this question of Christianity and nationalism. Some of you know that this institution is founded in the tradition of Germany. In fact, the first numbers of years that this school was teaching. The primary, the only language was German. And so there's a particular responsibility by this institution around the questions of our roots and who we are as a faithful people. Because it was founded by the Evangelical Reformed Church, which is now our beloved United Church of Christ. And in that, we have young people folks from all the religious traditions and none, and this is their home. They belong here, the way all of us belong here. What am I doing as the chaplain to frame, focus, and care for that tender treasure that is this institution? And it was quite easy when I hit that 7.30 moment and started really thinking AM about got the milk, got the party ready to plan, here they come. There's one person in the nation, there are many, but there's one person in the nation that has had an immense impact on this conversation of Christian nationalism. Our president of our United Church of Christ nationally and the general minister, general title that I always mix up, has a long history of reflection and work to care, to challenge, to build. Our guest tonight, Reverend Dr. John Dorhauer, is no, he knows this institution very well. He sent his own son here. And we had the joy of being up here and doing all kinds of crazy things at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday night for worship and his son was a part of that. And his son met a wonderful woman. They're part of that met and married crowd that we laugh and talk about. And John is here, the son, and teaches in our faculty. John Dorhauer, the father, has been on campus many times to support our work and me in particular. 
But you should know his first rounds of ed education were leading him towards priesthood in the Catholic tradition. And then for a host of reasons, chose to leave that tradition, taking undergraduate degrees, graduate degrees at Eden Seminary. He did his doctoral work on white privilege and served in local churches, served from local churches into regional sections of the jurisdiction of the church, and then being elected nationally. And he is finishing his eighth year, two terms, two four-year terms. And if our president was here, I would rather him say this. John's going to be our commencement speaker this year and getting an honorary degree from the university. And it's one of the great joys that our little college, now university, can recognize someone like John. We have boards of members of the trustees here. We have our vice president for academic affairs. We have a lot of you. We have some amazing students. We have somebody who's helping organize the World Student Christian Federation in Aaron. And I hope that if you don't know about the World Student Christian Federation, you will learn more about it. We'll talk about that later tonight. Our hope was to give a platform for us to be able to think and care and talk about something that is critical. It is in the tradition of the Niebuhrs, which are alums of this institution, and it is in the tradition of the United Church of Christ. So for those of you who have never been to our campus, welcome home, because this is your university. And it's in that call in the joy of what this night represents and the difficulty of the conversation that we all are involved in, that I invite you all to join with me in welcoming Reverend Dr. John Dorhauer to the podium. Beloved, welcome, John. Well, I can't tell you, first of all, how delighted and honored I am to be speaking on this uh, rather hallowed ground. I owe a lot to Scott, who both helped shape the spiritual well-being of two young adults whom I happen to care a lot about, and who has been a friend and a companion on my journey through good times and bad. And so when the call came from him to have the opportunity to speak tonight, it was an easy and quick yes. It's also a subject matter that I've been passionate about for some time. I also want to offer my own deep and profound gratitude to the faculty, the staff, and the student body of Elmhurst University. We're going to discuss something tonight that is rather sobering. And it is places like this campus where young minds can come and flourish in the presence of ideas that are generated without an expectation that all thinking must conform to one way of thinking. That is the real hope for the survival of this democracy that we call the United States. And so What the faculty engage in every day is noble. What the students present themselves here to do is important work, and it will be on their shoulders that democracy is preserved, if all goes the way we hope it does. One disclaimer before I begin my presentation. It occurs to me, as I read through what I have prepared for you, that one could make assumptions about either my political or religious affiliation. I ask you to free yourself of those expectations and not draw any conclusions because I promise you most of the conclusions you draw would not be accurate. It may appear that I am being overly critical of a particular political party. I assure you I am not. What I am about to share with you has nothing to do with the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. It has to do with a very tiny fringe movement in this country that is gaining purchase in political halls across this um, country of ours. 
and there is an articulation of both conservative ideology and Republican political ideology that is in no way consistent with what I'm about to share with you this evening. And those traditions are deep and rich in America and should be honored. On Saturday, August 12th, 2017, I was watching live coverage of the Black Lives Matter peaceful protest in Charlottesville when a white supremacist rally broke out. My friend, my colleague, and fellow elected officer of the United Church of Christ, the Reverend Tracy Blackman, was being interviewed live on MSNBC from the streets of Charlottesville. Charlottesville. She was part of that peaceful resistance effort that was growing around Black Lives Matter. In fact, she was one of the lead organizers in the streets of Ferguson when Black Lives Matter gained some purchase there after the murder of Michael Brown. Tracy helped give new life to that movement while she was pastoring in Ferguson, Missouri, just two years earlier. I had actually spoken with Tracy the night before that live interview in Charlotte, uh, Charlottesville. Um, and she had sent me a recording, a video recording that she had captured on her phone when having finished speaking at one of the local churches in Charlottesville, she left to head to her car and to rest up for the next day's events. And what she encountered when she left the church chilled her to the bone. Marching in a long menacing line were young white men carrying tiki, tiki torches and chanting of racist taunts and taunts like you will not replace us, taunts like the South will rise again and she was then rendered unable to leave the sanctuary for fear of her safety. She was then held for a few hours by local police in the basement of that church until that white supremacist rally ended. And she called me on her phone as she left the church just to make sure that she was talking with somebody in case something happened and fearing once again for her safety would be the next day, Saturday, that she was being interviewed on live television. And Joy Reid, who was sitting in her studio at the MSNBC broadcast booth, had spent a few minutes getting impressions from Tracy about what was unfolding there in the city. You could hear loud noises uh, in the background, and you could begin to see Tracy glancing from side to side out of the corner of her eyes, um, wondering what those noises were. Joy, sensing some danger, asked, are you okay, Tracy? The interview came to an abrupt halt. And before Tracy could respond, Tracy was swept aside, knocked completely out of view of the camera. Joy panicked, thinking that maybe the mob had got to her. And she began calling Tracy's name over and over again and getting no response. And as I was watching this, I too began to fear for her safety. The producers finally broke away from the interview, went to a commercial break, and started covering something else. It would be a little while before I would learn that Tracy was okay, that she was in fact swept aside by her bodyguards, which the city had provided to her after the threats the previous evening. She had become a target. And as violence began erupting on the streets, she was taken away quickly by men designed to protect her. It would only be a few short minutes later that white supremacist terrorist James Alex Fields would drive his car through the line of peaceful protesters and murder Heather Heyer. Reflecting with me later on this mob, Tracy, with some interest and curiosity, noted how many of those white supremacists, both on Friday and on Saturday, were wearing polo shirts. Gone from white hoods to polo shirts. Racism had become, in her words, mainstream again. It was now the fashionable thing for white men to be. And this is what Donald Trump did while sounding every white supremacist dog whistle he could, including saying just days after Heather Heyer's murder, there were good people on both sides. He brought the very people 
that society had shamed into the margins back out from under the rocks under which they had been hiding since the end of the civil rights movement. Now, we've always had bigots, and the civil rights movement didn't end that, but for a spell, we lacked a catalyst that would make them feel something other than public shame for their bigotry. This whole phenomenon is what Michelle Goldberg, a brilliant investigative journalist, calls the rise of Christian nationalism. That, by the way, The Rise of Christian Nationalism, is the subtitle to her landmark book on the subject entitled Kingdom Coming. Michelle was among the first investigative journalists to recognize what was coming, Christian nationalism as a resurgence of fundamentalism that not only adheres with zealous intensity to a very narrow set of religious doctrines, but also lives with the belief that God has refused to accept anything other than their narrow doctrine and that America is beholden to the teachings of and restricted by the mandates of their God. That same God, the God proclaimed by the Christian nationalists, empowers its adherents to eliminate all threats to its flourishing, producing a very venomous brand of the ends justify the means moral code and giving birth to the kind of resistance seen in the January 6th insurrection and the kind of rhetoric now flourishing in the halls of Congress from leaders like Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Bobbert, Matt Gates, Josh Hawley, Paul Gosar, Tommy Tuberville, Louis Gohmert, Doug Mastriani, and so many others. Emboldened by a rising tide of white supremacist populists who are being courted by the extreme right wing of the Republican Party, these elected officials are working hard to rewrite the story of America through the lens of a narrow, fringe view of Christianity that will not tolerate any deviance from their narrative that says that America was intended from the beginning to be Christian, white, heterosexual, and run by men. The attack on wokeness, the attack on critical race theory, the attack on religious pluralism, the attack on secular ideology, the attack on trans children and their parents, the attacks on interracial marriage, the attack on women's reproductive rights, the attack on the rights to privacy, the attacks on access to birth control, the attacks on the drag culture, all staples of a thriving democracy and all critical to the pursuit of one's happiness without fear of government intervention are all byproducts of a religious fundamentalism parading as patriotism and known simply as Christian nationalism. To understand the motivations and tactics of Christian nationalists and to provide a little context into the mindset of those empowered by their zealousness for a sword-wielding Jesus, I want to share with you a story about something that happened to me one Sunday at a church in South St. Louis that had been targeted for takeover by a Christian nationalist pastor. It would take me all of tomorrow to unpack what I mean by targeted for a takeover, uh, but if you want to learn more about that, read my first book, Steeplejacking, How the Christian Right is Hijacking Mainstream Religion. While researching what would become that book, co-written by the magnificent Reverend Sheldon Culver, there was an older woman in that church, that Redeemer Church, who was a lifelong member, who was watching with horror what was happening to her faith community. And it was she, that older woman, who would give me a recording of the sermon preached at Church of the Redeemer that Sunday in South St. Louis. I was at the time working on the staff of the Missouri Mid-South Conference, and I had been assigned the task of figuring out why so many churches around the conference and the country were all of a sudden exploding with conflict over religious doctrine and threatening to leave the denomination. The United Church of Christ was founded with the understanding that we hold no defining doctrine. We said we don't have tests of faith, we have testimonies of faith. 
And all Christians, regardless of their individual beliefs, are free to gather at the table in love and fellowship with us. Actually, I'm being a little limiting in saying that. It's not just all Christians. All people are free to gather at that table with us, Christian or otherwise. To all of a sudden have churches threatening to remove a pastor who doesn't believe in the virgin birth or to vote to leave the denomination because a church an hour away from them hired a gay pastor made no sense. So I was a part of a small team asked to research what was happening and what I discovered were the early roots of what we now know as Christian nationalism. It's a bit of a winding road to get from where I started in this exploration to what I know today. We don't have time to unfold all of that here. And yet it was happening all over with great frequency. Here's what we learned. What I uncovered in our investigative work was that behind these disruptions in our churches was something we could have never anticipated. A group known as the IRD, the Institute on Religion and Democracy, and if you've never heard of them, you should know about them. Google them, the IRD, the Institute on Religion and Democracy. They were being funded by right-wing neoconservative political big shots, heavy hitters in the far right wing of the neoconservative Republican Party. These were heavy hitters with big sums of cash that they used to fuel and fund right-wing politics. The IRD is in and of itself worthy of an entire lecture on its own, but for now, just know that they are a key player in both the rise of Christian nationalism in the disruptions we were experiencing in our churches. It, the IRD, is run by a farmer, former dark ops agent trained and working for the CIA. I'm not making that up. By the name of Mark Tooley. And the IRD uses funds in their language, not mine, to, quote, train operatives, unquote, to foment dissent in otherwise content and happy congregations. Now, it would be one thing if the churches decided it was time to have an open debate about homosexuality. It's another thing when a trained operative was walking into the church and telling the church that if they're truly Christian, they would be having this discussion and embroiling them in controversy. Using field research to sniff out what they call wedge issues, issues that can create division within the church, the IRD sent out trained operatives into congregations to use their well-researched wedge issues to foment dissent and have them wreak all the havoc they can create. Now, you may ask why. Political backers of right-wing politics would fund an organization to disrupt churches who were otherwise content. Well, they're Christian nationalists whose view of the world in America are fairly, shall I say, racist and homophobic and misogynistic. And they grieve the coming of a time when white men will be in the minority and fear the threat of violence for their past sins against people of color and native people. And so using religious zealots with narrow theologies as a tool for their ambition makes perfect sense when you think about it. After all, progressive mainline faith movements and congregations have always fueled almost every significant social justice movement we know. From the abolitionists, to the suffragists, to the unionists, to gay activists, and so many more movements, progressive faith of all stripes gave new life to these justice movements, and silencing their voices, minimizing their impact, while embroiling them in internal battles is a brilliant strategy and worthy of their funding. And that's where George Dome comes in. George was the former pastor of and preacher that Sunday at Redeemer Church in South St. Louis, targeted for attack and takeover. In fact, George told them when he came to preach that Sunday that if in fact they would vote to leave the United Church of Christ, he would come back and serve as their pastor. And the sermon that he would preach that Sunday, in which the older woman I spoke of a moment ago would capture on tape, gave us what was his shot across the bow to that church to motivate them to do just that, to leave the UCC. 
He was there to tell them that their denomination, the United Church of Christ, the very denomination I am now general minister and president of, that's the wacky title. He was there to tell them that that denomination was evil. You think I exaggerate. Then listen to what happened and you can be your own judge of that. In that sermon, George told this story. A father sat at the breakfast table with his children as they prepared to leave for school that morning. And in the conversation with dad, they asked if they could go see a certain movie this next coming weekend. And dad said, no, there are some violent scenes in that movie that I don't think are appropriate for children your age. And the children replied, well, sure, dad, but not that much. The kids left for school. And dad wanted to teach them a lesson about not that much. And so while they were at school, he baked them a tray of brownies to eat for dessert that night. He went into the yard and gathered up some dog poop. My, while I apologize for the vulgar nature of what is to come in this story, I am choosing to tell it exactly the way George did from the pulpit of Redeemer United Church of Christ. The dad took that dog poop, which he harvested from his backyard, and cooked it into the brownies. When the kids finished dinner that night, dad asked, who wants brownies? And the children responded quickly and eagerly, saying, of course, they did. So dad cut them a piece, and just as they were about to take their first bite, he stopped them and told them what he did. Oh, they were angry and refused to eat any, at which point he said, but it was only just a little, not that much. The father made his point. And now George, the preacher telling that story, would make his. Having finished telling that story, one I can never imagine telling in an act of worship, George said, the United Church of Christ is the dog crap cooked into the brownie of Christianity. Just a little bit of it ruins the whole thing. Let's just pause there for a moment. I tell this story not to shock, although it is quite shocking. I tell it to help us wrap our heads around something very important, trying to understand the mind of the Christian nationalist. This story reveals the mindset of those who arm themselves with the Jesus of Christian nationalism, Disregard for the moment, if you will, the vulgarity of the story. I want you to fully focus not on what he said, but why he said it and the logical consequences of his story being played out. George was saying, even a small remnant of an evil entity like my progressive brand of religion is intolerable to God and must be destroyed, both because it is evil and because it contaminates by its mere existence the purity of his doctrine and religion. And so on God's behalf, Christian nationalists are not called to minimize or downgrade or mitigate the influence of progressive religion or progressive Christianity. We are an evil that must be eradicated. If even the small, smallest bit of us is left behind, it infects and ruins the whole enterprise of Christianity. Now, George could justify what he did because God empowered him to act by whatever means necessary to eliminate, eradicate, annihilate an enemy he believed the mere presence of threatened the integrity of his faith and called into question his dedication to his maker. In other words, George didn't want to die and go to heaven and say, why didn't you wipe them out like I told you to? The only way he could prove his dedication to his God and his religion was to actively engage in my, in our utter annihilation. Understanding this is critical to knowing just how seriously we must take the work of Christian nationalism. Is Andrew Weaver, a United Methodist minister and clinical psychologist with whom I would travel the country speaking about this, used to say with that thick Texas Southern drawl of his, friends, these people are playing tackle football and we're playing touch and we're going to lose this game every time. 
when we talk about Christian nationalism, it's important that you wrap your mind around what it is we are dealing with. America at its finest is an open marketplace of ideas in which thinkers and dreamers compete for influence and appeal. This version of America has a First Amendment free speech mandate, an establishment cause that creates an effective wall of separation between church and state, and the guarantee of a free press. All of this to ensure an unimpeded articulation of opposing ideas that foster the democratic ideals of the voices being lifted up in the marketplace, of citizens being informed, engaged, challenged, and enlightened, of competing ideologies being tested and scrutinized and interrogated, and of the toleration of differing opinions along with the respect of those who hold them. What Christian nationalism wants, what it demands, what it is willing to fight and, yes, kill for, is the eradication of any idea inconsistent with its own. It also espouses the eradication of those who propagate those ideas. It wants written into the Constitution the instantiation of Christian fundamentalism and the recognition of biblical literalism that uses strict, though utterly contradictory, moral codes within their canon is the foundation of law. If you want to know what that looks like, read the writings of R.J. R. J. Rush Dooney. Perhaps the single most influential writer in the establishment of Christian nationalism. His legal principles form the basis for the curriculum and teaching of Regent University's law school. Founded by Pat Robertson, yes, that Pat Robertson, mogul emperor of the Christian Broadcasting Network, himself a graduate of Yale Law, he went on to found Regent University to teach lawyers how to rewrite American law and interpret it through the lens of biblical literalism. This is the same Pat Robertson who told America that when the Twin Towers fell on 9-11, it was because of gay men. And lest you think his influence or his brand of Christian nationalism is a fringe movement, take note that in 2007, in the Bush White House, there were over 150 graduates of his Regent University School of Law serving in his administration in the White House. Over 150. Lest you think Christian nationalism is a fringe movement, Remember this, that the longest tenured federal appointee to the U.S. government, none other than J. Edgar Hoover himself, who led the FBI from 1924 until his death in 1972, a remarkable 48 years, was an avowed Christian nationalist. That's the language he used to describe himself. And when he took the job in 1924, he immediately fired all black and Jewish agents and demoted them or let, had them leave the agency. When he took office, he required all of his white male agents to attend an annual retreat led by a Jesuit priest, and then later in that year, attend a prayer vigil only for those same white Christian nationalist agents. The term he used to describe his agents was Christian soldiers. Lest you think Christian nationalism is a fringe movement, Think about the recent hostile takeover of New College in Sarasota, Florida, by Governor Ron DeSantis earlier this year. Like Elmhurst University, New College was founded and funded with mission dollars from a United Church of Christ that believes that higher education is a pathway to living your most fulfilling life. They also held the United Church of Christ that on campuses like this one and at New College in Sarasota, Various ideologies would be tested and explored and flourish on our campuses. They believed that such a campus would be a place where no one would be judged by the color of their skin, their religious ideology, their political persuasion, or their gender identity. While visiting students at New College last month, speaking at the protest rally that they led, I later in the day watched the new board of directors appointed by Governor Ron DeSantis vote to close the diversity, equity, and inclusion office on campus. Coming next will be the rewriting of their curriculum, 
the purging of professors who teach concepts contrary to what white Christian nationalists now deem mainstream, and the shunning and or transferring of students who had created what was for many of them the first safe community they ever knew in which they could express their full identity without fear of recrimination or judgment. Within months, this campus will have been devastated by the hostile takeover of Christian nationalists. That same Ron DeSantis, by the way, was a recent visitor to the town of Elmhurst. What do you think he was doing here? Lest you think Christian nationalism is a fringe movement, Consider how many school boards and state houses today are being taken over by parents and legislators who are editing out histories that mention slavery, banning books, instituting prayer in school practices, prohibiting teachers from acknowledging a student's preferred pronouns, shutting down every attempt to teach children and youth about safe and healthy practices around sexual health and identity, and forbidding young women are forcing young women to provide evidence of their menstruation cycle. Lest you think Christian nationalism is a fringe movement, understand that the Federalist Society has actively and successfully campaigned to appoint conservative judges to the Supreme Court. Leonard Leo, the executive vice president of the Federalist Society, personally handed a short list of judges for Donald Trump to consider and his choices came directly from the list provided to him by Leonard Leo and the Federalist Society. And Donald Trump's most enduring and impactful legacy will be the creation of a 6-3 right-wing majority Christian nationalist-leaning Supreme Court that has already overturned Roe v. Wade, that now has marriage equality, prayer in school, interracial marriage, the Affordable Health Care Act, affirmative action, and so much more within its sights. That majority is a potential 25 to 30 year horror show in which hard won human rights will get rolled back by an activist court whose loyalties are more aligned with the religious zealots who appointed them than to the constitution they swore to uphold. Lest you think Christian nationalism is a fringe movement, as I sat one morning two weeks ago composing my ideas for this presentation, I got a text. For the previous two weeks, I had been talking to and consulting with a pastor of our UCC church in Loomis, California. His church was sponsoring a drag show. Now to some today, they, today here today, that may sound unusual, but in my role as a conference minister for the United Church of Christ, I was once invited by one church to attend a drag show where members of their church performed and at which Miss Gay Universe herself was also present and performed and she was spectacular. I was also once asked to be a judge at a drag show where gay men in drag portrayed Jesus in a costume that spoke to them about what Jesus meant to them pastor here in question was targeted by a megachurch pastor in the area who first went to the school that would host the drag show after hours at the school and used his influence and his power to shut the event down. But that wasn't enough. He began then preaching from his pulpit telling his members that this pastor should not be tolerated, even implying outright that he should not live much longer if he was propagating such a faith. Remember, it's not the minimization of our voice that they're after, it's the annihilation of our bodies and minds. The pastor started receiving threats, as did members of his church. And again, as I sat composing this speech to you, I received this text from him, which I'm going to read to you word for word as it came to me. Last night, for 45 minutes, two proud boys stood outside our home with a megaphone calling for me to come out, calling me a groomer, calling me a pedophile, saying that I shouldn't feel safe in my neighborhood or in our community, and yelling out that my own neighbors should seek to make me feel unsafe. All this occurred on a live YouTube, YouTube stream where he repeatedly called for others to show up at my house every evening until I came out. I had two neighbors who had the courage to attempt to confront those men. They were met with homophobic slurs and the threat of violence against them. 
lest you think Christian nationalism is a fringe movement, ask yourself under what circumstances you would firebomb a church. Well, we found out two weeks ago when Community Church of Chesterland, United Church of Christ, was firebombed when somebody threw Molotov cocktails at their building in an attempt to burn it to the ground. Why? Because they were sponsoring a week later a day of events celebrating trans life and trans community. Thank God that this church, which houses a daycare center for children, escaped with only burns to the outside of the building, no interior or structural damage, and no one, including those precious children, injured. Within a few hours of the bombing of the church, the Proud Boys appeared online and shared that they would be out in full force on the day the church celebrated the trans community and their trans members. Two nights after the bombing of the church, I sat with members of that congregation for a few hours of conversation to express my solidarity with and support for their good work. An elderly woman rose to speak. And she shared that she had responded to a Facebook post, or somebody had responded to a Facebook post that she put up, and the response was very mean and very angry. And she replied, and when she did, that person sent her a direct message that included only her address. Now think about what that means. Just two days after her church was firebombed, this elderly woman chose to express her grief about that on Facebook, only to receive a not-so-veiled threat that simply communicated, I know where you live. These are all snapshots of Christian nationalism at work. A glimpse of what a commitment to my religion will become your religion or you will suffer looks like. These are actual events in which the permission, the call, the mandate, not to correct bad theology from their point of view, but to eliminate it in those who espouse it is given by a judgmental God in search of a loyal band of crusading marauders willing to annihilate the non-believers. And this is most certainly no longer a fringe movement. This is the America dreamed of by white Christian nationalists. Reports out of Homeland Security in recent years identified homegrown white supremacist Christian nationalist terrorists as the greatest threat to American democracy and security. That's our own Homeland Security office. In her daily column chronicling the machinations of the far right, Heather Cox Richardson, and if you're not subscribed to her newsletter, I strongly encourage you to be, recently reported the, uh, that the Office of the Director of National Intelligence released the 2023 Annual Threat Assessment of U.S. Intelligence Community, and it warned that racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, RMVEs, continue to pose a threat more lethal to U.S. persons and interests than do Islamist terrorists. Christian nationalism has moved from the fringes to the center of American jurisprudence, American legislation, education, and religion. Leaders of this democracy must begin to take this threat very seriously and no longer remain naive about either its current capacity to unravel our democracy or its desire to apply violence in the effort to do so. In their minds, this violence is a justifiable means to a divinely inspired end. Christian nationalists have been detected in our police forces, our military, our schools, our school boards, our courtrooms, our houses of Congress, and yes, even our White House. Treating this ideology as an academic debate to be had by the culture at large is a big mistake. Defending either democracy or a more tolerant version of Christianity in debate with Christian nationalists is pointless. They will not be worn over by persuasive arguments, nor by the content of our beliefs. I recommend the following six actions to inoculate ourselves against this rising tide of hatred to protect and preserve our democracy and to safeguard against a growing segment of our population who are feeling more and more empowered to eradicate us if we don't conform to their narrow beliefs. First, read. Learn everything you can about Christ, the Christian right and Christian nationalists. Knowing who the players are, what their tactics are, where they operate, what they teach, what their talking points and dog whistles are, how they recruit, how to recognize their symbology, and so much more is essential. Just a quick aside. I lived for the last eight years on a small thoroughfare in uh, the exurbs of Cleveland, 
And two doors down from me, I was walking down the street and saw a flag I'd never seen before, uh, a white field in the circle, the head of a lion. And there was no markings other than that on there. And I immediately took a picture of it and went to the internet and discovered that that is a symbol for white supremacist neo-Nazis. I had one living two doors down from me, and he didn't have a swastika out. So recognizing the symbols that they use and that evolve is important. Ignorance will not be bliss when it comes to confronting what has become a very sophisticated propaganda machine. Second, vote, and I mean vote for everything. 30 years ago, the moral majority started encouraging Christian nationalists to run for city councils, county governments, school boards, judgeships, sheriff positions, and everything else you can think of. And when you vote, look up what you can about the platforms of every candidate. School boards are being taken over by parents who want vouchers to pay for private school educations at which children are indoctrinated in a very fundamentalist view of Christianity. Those same parents are creating banned book lists which, if left unchecked, will slowly erode everything democracy stands for. They're rewriting history books, banning critical race theory, closing down programs dedicated to gender and feminist studies, shunning trans students, refusing to grant access to gender-neutral bathrooms on their campus, and telling teachers they're forbidden from asking for or about preferred pronouns. So vote. Every election matters. Third, speak. As Edmund Burke once wrote, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. Black liberation theologian James Cone once wrote a landmark essay entitled Theology's great sin, silence in the face of white supremacy. Whites, and white Christians especially, have a moral obligation to call out the overt acts of racism and white power being repeated daily across this land. Whites are known for their complicitous silence. The price they are willing to pay, as long as the bulk of the damage is borne by brown and black bodies, and as long as the trappings and baubles of privilege keep leaking their way. The silence at times can be deafening. We must all add our voice of outrage to the growing tide of white supremacist, Christian nationalist propaganda that is plaguing our democracy, our culture, and our country. Lift up your voice and sing. Let no act of Christian nationalist propaganda or violence go by and you fail to notice it or speak out against it. Fourth, expose. If you encounter, meet, or experience someone demonstrating their bigotry, their misogyny, their homophobia, and you can find a way to expose them, that can be a great help. So much of what they do, they do while lurking in the shadows. There were a lot of young white men who marched in, in Charlottesville that night when Tracy Blackman was there who lost their jobs when pictures of them were shown to their employers. The same thing happened to white supremacists who marched in an insurrection against our capital on January 6th in 2021. Building a database designed to expose not just the vitriol they spew, but those who spew it can prove very helpful. Fifth, show up. When there are rallies, demonstrations, events celebrating democracy or advocating for the human rights of women, of BIPOC communities, of the trans community, or of any marginalized people to become the targets of Christian nationalists, show up. When the call goes out to march, to protest, to rally, to speak, to sing, to act, be there. We live in a land where citizens have a constitutional right to gather, to influence, and to alter the pathways built to impede justice. And finally, and this is not a comprehensive list, conspire. I used to call myself an ally in the struggle for racial justice. A significant black leader in the movement informed me that I should not be his ally. I should be his co-conspirator. So from this point forward, I conspire. I meet with black and brown and marginalized leaders who are the targets of Christian nationalists, and I do what I am told. I show up, I write, I speak, I act, I vote, I march, whatever it takes, and I don't do it alone. I do it all with the full conspiratorial intent aligned with what leaders in the movement for justice see as their pathway to equity. An important word of advice on this point, because I am white, I do not, I will not, and I should not drive the bus for justice and equity. 
My Solutions is a privileged white male heterosexual who sits, frankly, at the top of the privileged pyramid built by white heteronormative men for their own sustenance and well-being will always come up short of the mark. Like most whites, I participate long enough to assuage my guilt. And I always avoid the uncomfortable talk about reparations. I don't, but many of us do. That's another subject. So my model of engagement is an accompaniment model built by liberation theologians. I show up and conspire to accompany leaders from communities targeted and marginalized by white Christian nationalists on their chosen pathway to justice and equity, and I don't quit until they tell me that they have won the equity that they have been marching and fighting for. Now I'm gonna stop here. This is a very large subject. There's so much more to say and do about this. I hope I've given you enough this evening to at least take this very seriously, to begin to engage your full agency as a co-conspirator in your capacity to join a movement to preserve democracy in America and help it one day create and become the beloved community dreamed of by Dr. King and promised in a founding document that held that all people are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them the right to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. One's life, one's liberty, one's pursuit of happiness cannot be proscribed by or limited to the choices made for you by white Christian nationalists. They may think they have that right. It's up to all of us to assure them they do not. Thank you. Our guest has offered a chance for us to have a little Q&A time. And as always, I open that door with a question. Can you say your name? Because we want to know your name. So you start with that, please. And can you ask a question? A lot of us have preacher problems and can carry on for hours. <laughs> and I know there's a lot of those folks here that are wonderful. But I'm asking you to ask a question. So I need your name, and I, have, and I will try to roam around. And we've got um, about 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so, because there are grandchildren waiting for our guest at home right now. And that is really what's driving this. But I'll start here. Can you give us your name, please, and your question? My name is Susan Wakefield Dalporto. There is an organization headquartered in Naperville, just down the road from here, called Awake that is uh, doing exactly what you've told and trying to get candidates onto school boards and library boards, but they are being very insidious. They come across as very smart. They're not even using coded language, and it's really hard to pinpoint what they're doing, but they have so much money behind them. So thinking about your points at the end, which were helpful, how do we begin to fight against this organization awake, which is scaring me to death uh, because they will not be truthful about their agenda. But they are, uh, in the recent local elections that were held last week, they infiltrated every w Northwest suburban school board race that I am aware of. Thank you. This is a very important question. There are two things I would say in response, and this is far from a comprehensive response to what is a very complex matter. The first is, if you have nobody running in opposition to them on your side of the aisle, then find somebody or run yourself, if that's what it takes. Um, and second, there are questions that can be asked that even if they refuse to answer, it will be evident that they refuse to answer. That will serve as a signal and a warning to what actually is coming here. And, and it would be smart to prepare questions like that ahead of time so that in a public forum, you can address those questions to them. And when they begin to equivocate, point out that I just want everybody to note 
that they're refusing to answer what seems like a pretty simple and very important question. Over here, we had a question. Good evening. I'd like to bring greetings from my home church, First Congregation of Long Beach, California. I've preached at that I church. Oh, you have, yes. <laughs> and your and, former um, pastor, Mark Pettis, sends along his Well, you know, he's in Cleveland, I think. <laughs> he's on my team. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. Uh, and I'm so glad to be here in Elmhurst. Um, out there, sometimes I think maybe we might have our heads in the sand uh, over this particular yeah. topic, thinking, oh, well, it ain't going to happen here. What would you tell us Westerners on this topic? Coming to a state near you soon. This, this is a growing virus. And there is nowhere that is fully inoculated or immune from this, the spread of this disease. So be vigilant. There are parts of California that are already thoroughly um, uh, indoctrinated with white Christian nationalism. The further north you go in California, the more prevalent it is there. Um, and it has a mandate to grow. So being naive about its current presence or articulation in your community is, is not a wise strategy. We can talk about reactive measures, at, but we can also talk about prophylactic measures and prescriptive proactive measures. And if I were you, I would begin identifying leaders in the community that you can conspire with to already be doing informative sessions like this on who Christian nationalists are, what to recognize, and how to defend ourselves against them. Don't wait for it to come, because it will come. And you want to be ready when it does. Reverend Jackie Belial, I serve Eden UCC in Chicago. I owe Scott Matheny a phone call. Um, could you unpack this a little bit more, uh, John, that couple lines you had before the six recommendations where you talked about um, treating the ideology as academic debate. Maybe you said it was naive. Yep. Debating with them yep. is pointless. Yep. Could you describe for us what you might know or have written about that, that has examples of that? Is there like field research about that, attempts to do that that have failed? Uh, I, I found that just a very provocative extreme statement. In 2005, in July of 2005, the United Church of Christ became the first religious body in the world to affirm marriage equality, right? In the aftermath of that, the, the IRD, whom I referred to earlier, had a heyday with their trained operatives fomenting dissent. 44 churches in the Indiana, Kentucky Conference left within six months of the passage of that resolution. I became a part of a team in the Missouri Mid-Conference, South Conference, while also doing the research that I referenced earlier, traveling around to congregation after congregation after congregation to try to quell the disruptions that were erupting all over the place. And for about three months, I and Sheldon Culver, my co-author of that book, believed that the best approach was to walk into those settings and do a very well thought out, cogent, rational argument for the United Church of Christ's openness to all ideas. And we were getting our heads best against the wall. Nobody was listening. Everything that we said went unheard and only prompted more anger and ire. And we had to step back and say, what in the world is going on here? That's anecdotal, but it's demonstrative of the point that I'm making. Under no circumstances were we going to walk into a community that was fired up about this and present the, just the right rational justification for what we did that would make them go, aha, you're right. So two quick things about that. It was very important for those who were either on the fence or already fully supportive to hear that rational justification. That was important. Here's where the research is effective. And I spoke about this earlier. The earliest part of the brain to evolve was the amygdala, right? The amygdala is what warns us that there's a threat present to which we must respond if we're going to survive. And to, in the immediacy of the moment, for the sake of survival, determine whether or not our best course of action is to fight or to flee, the fight or flight option. 
It is important. We would not have evolved as human species if the amygdala, amygdala didn't have the capacity to shut down higher order thinking because you couldn't debate your way internally through a dialogue about which of your 12 options were your best. By then, you were eaten by the lion. So to evolve and for the higher order thinking to, to, to become what it is, the amygdala had to take control. What makes Christian nationalism effective as a movement is it engenders fear, right? At the base of everything that you are experiencing in the presence of a white supremacist nationalist is fear. And no higher order thinking can persuade somebody who is triggered by their fear to believe differently about the moment that they're in and the approach they need to take. And one final thing about that. In her book, The Battle for God, Karen Armstrong writes about the phenomenon of fundamentalism and traces its roots through its history in the Abrahamic religions, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. And what she notes throughout history is there's always a fundamentalist voice. It only becomes prevalent in cultures and seasons where the economic outlook of a population feels uncertain. There are 90 million refugees now swarming the globe. And the in economic insecurity felt by those 90 million refugees is not isolated to their life. This is a global reality. The, the euro currency is sinking and countries across Europe are going bankrupt. And so the threat of economic insecurity is making fundamentalism in our time a very real option. And it brokers on the sense of insecurity and fear. And recognizing that it's the fear that must be confronted and not the higher order thinking that needs to be persuaded is a critical strategic move in the neutralizing of the impact of Christian nationalism. We have a question here, John. And there's a hand way in the back. I'm Matthew Berry, yeah. And I, I, it's more of a comment than a question. I was, I was going to say that this Christian nationalism, well, you're talking about a United States context, like related to the worldwide phenomenon. This is more global. Uh, mm -hmm. well, like you have ver various religious nationalisms playing out. Uh, yep. Like Jair, Bo Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, Vladimir Putin, no. Victor Orban, Victor Orban, no. and now and now in Israel, uh, even in non-Christian nationalisms, uh, like there's it's sort of related to this. Uh. You are very Thank right, you. and. There is a particular brand of Christian nationalism endemic to the U.S. because of our history with um, white supremacist ideology. Um, but this is a global phenomenon. So I'm going to make a joke about the back seat, you know, the back of the church, back of the chapel. We, I wanted to come back here because we've got great folks that want to ask a question and say their name. Okay. Uh, Jim Parks. Hi, Jim. Thank you for being here. Um, I, your actions for all of us are great. I'm wondering if you have a different set of actions for your fellow leaders of other Christian and non-Christian faith denominations. Um, no, I think these apply regardless of religious or attachment or affiliation. I would add one thing, Jim. Um, look for partners in the movement. What I mean by that are organizations or bodies that are committed to the common good and who are willing to act alongside you and with you in the struggle for justice and peace, many of whom have no religious affiliation. When I was marching in the streets of Arizona for immigration justice, for marriage equality, it was very often leaders from uh, uh, community organizing efforts that were walking side by side with us. And so I wouldn't change this based on one's uh, faith orientation 
or based on one's uh, uh, walk without faith. Um, that the, those, those work, and again, it's far from comprehensive, um, but look for partners beyond those who either have, espouse your religious ideology and those who have no religious ideology whatsoever. Yeah, Jim, you want to follow up? Mm. Jim, I, I want to think more deeply about the question you're asking. My, my immediate response is, is no. I think these would apply across the board. But I think you're asking me to think deeply about something that I haven't yet, and I will do that. Back here, we have a great question, please. Yep. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mike. Hi, How Mike. are you doing? Um, I want to touch back on the topic of debate. It sounded like you were talking about people just debating individually in the wild on their own recognizance. Um, I want to touch on the idea of formal debate, though. By an amazing coincidence, at the University of Tennessee, um, there is a debate on this topic that's happening right now. They're about two hours into a live stream. 11,000 people are watching. It's Destiny and Milo, if anyone knows those names, if they're very online. Um, is this the sort of thing that you recommend that people check out and see how it goes, or do you yeah. just assume it's not worthwhile and people should not check it out? So thank you, Mike. And I'll say two things about that. And the, first of all, the immediate answer is yes, I would invite people to check that out. Um, when I was serving in a church in the heart of the Bible Belt in southern Missouri, um, I saw the religious divide tearing families in that community apart. And I actually got a grant from the national setting of the United Church of Christ to run a program that I called Voices of Reason. And I wasn't intending to persuade anybody. I just wanted to model to that community that debate could be held by people with opposing and passionate points of view without sinking to ad hominem attacks or without reducing itself to vitriol and spewing hatred and judgment. And so over six weeks, I got... Uh, theologians from a Baptist seminary and college in the area with very fundamentalist views of theology to debate progressive theologians. And all I wanted to do was model, I, again, I didn't care who won the debate, I, it was a, a Harvard-style debate, um, I didn't care whose ideas were more prominent, I just wanted to model that it's possible for people with divergent theologies to actually have a reasoned conversation with one another and leave with respect for one another. So I really support what you're doing. The second thing is, not debate, but the kind of persuasive conversation that can change a heart takes place at an interpersonal level where first, trust is built. Without that, then our language to persuade somebody usually only puts them on the defensive and just reinstantiates not only their position, but their belief that it's the right position. If you want to persuade somebody, you've got to play the long game. And it has to be built on a relationship of trust first. Under those circumstances, when their heart goes out to you in love and trust, in that circumstance, you have the capacity to change a heart and mind. You also have to realize, though, you can't enter that relationship authentically without the possibility that your mind gets changed as well. We have a question back here, John. Yes. What's your name? Bill Lawrence. Uh, my question is about the Catholic Church. To what degree have Catholics in the Catholic Church weighed in on this struggle? So, there is a degree to which the Catholic Church are funders of this movement, largely because of the commitments to defeat uh, Roe v. Wade. Um, and don't let, it would be a mistake to talk about the Catholic Church even in the US, Roman Catholicism is a monolithic entity. And it is true that some of the most radical free thinkers who are a part of a movement to marginalize Christian nationalism are leaders within the Roman Catholic faith, church, and tradition. I spent a week with nuns on the bus when in 2016 the Republican Convention came a block away from our national headquarters of the United Church of Christ 
And Sister Simone is one of the most radical prophets of our time. And to listen to her on the streets of Cleveland talk to those Christian nationalists, that was amazing. I was a part of a group called Jazz, Jesuits uh, uh, in Arizona for, I, I, don't, I forget what the acronym was for, and these were some of the most radical, free-thinking religious minds that you would ever encounter and fully in love with their Roman Catholicism and fully at odds with the, uh, the leadership of certainly their diocese. Thomas Olstead was one of the most regressive bishops anywhere in the U.S. and He and I had a few debates along the way. So one of our esteemed faculty is no longer teaching now, but he is here. I'm Thomas Dudgeon. Uh, I'm a retired DuPage County judge. I am currently teaching. I will be done in about two weeks. Uh, I'm filling in for Dr. Walker, and I'm teaching a course on constitutional law here. Thank you. I also teach this course at Lewis University. So ecumenically, I'm rather diversified. Um, that brings me to my question. One of the things that I see going on, and correct me if I'm incorrect in this, is that much of this rhetoric, which is neither Christian nor American, is spread through a fundamentalist reading of the gospel. These folks have their own publishing houses and their own clearing houses, and they produce volumes and volumes of materials that are used by megachurches, non-denominational churches to spread this stuff. Yep. It seems to me that the challenge that a committed Christian has in this circumstance is our diversity yep. and our lack of centrality yep. because of the divisions within the various Christian denominations. What efforts are being made, if any, and how do we, as a diversified group of people who oppose these folks, get our message out in a unified fashion? It's a very good question. And first, let me say, did you ever imagine there would be a time when teaching constitutional law would be an act of rebellion in the United States? <laughs> our Thank you. Yep, that's the right response. So, and, and I'm going to. And give I you can a attest question. to the fact that he will not shut up. All right. I'm going to get to your question, but I, I want to point out that our brilliant in-house general counsel, in December of this year, delivered a keynote address on the state of law, constitutional law in the U.S., and it was spectacular and sobering. And one of the things she pointed out is that constitutional lawyers don't know what to teach anymore when the Supreme Court doesn't recognize the facts and doesn't recognize precedent as in any way influential on the outcome of their decisions. That's changing the landscape of jurisprudence in America in a fundamental way. Um, now, back to your question, which was, remind me, the, the short version of that. Yep, yep, I got it, I got it. So this is a very difficult question when it comes to developing counter strategies to what we experience on the religious right and the phenomenon of mega churches. It's an ideology that authorizes its leaders to tell its members what to think and believe. Therefore, they can write their books and force their members to buy the books and espouse the ideology presented therein. They can stand in the pulpit and tell the members how to vote. Maybe not directly, but communicate to them um, how to vote. In fact, back to the question of Roman Catholicism, there are bishops in every election that announce, if you vote for this candidate or vote for this referendum in this way, you will no longer be allowed to receive communion in the sanctuary of my Catholic Church in this diocese. There is no equivalent to that in progressive religion or Christianity. It is a way of being people of faith that says, develop your own thinking, define your own pathway to spiritual fulfillment. And so there's no strategical equivalent 
to producing a means by which we can propagate the kind of material to the same level of audience that we see on the religious right. And so our strategy has to be a little different than that. We, we, we just don't have that equivalent. The, in terms of, well, I'll, I'll stop there. It's, an, it's, it's what Andrew Weaver meant when he said they're playing tackle football and we're playing touch and we're going to lose this game every time. We have a question here, please. My name is Bill, and my, my is question is, what disciplines do you recommend progressives practice to safeguard against becoming an amygdala-driven movement fueled by fear of Christian nationalism? Yeah. Or is that not a yeah. concern? Yeah. Wow. So I have been... And, and I'm going to, part of my response is going to be within the context of leading a United Church of Christ whose foundational principle in terms of our polity is built around autonomy, which when coupled with American independence and the notion of pulling yourself up by your bootstrap without the help of others is a deadly combination. It has been said of the United Church of Christ when they write our epitaph, our gravestone will have but one word on it, and that word is autonomy. And I have been preaching across the, the landscape of our love for autonomy, the notion of interdependence, the, the notion that it takes a village, the notion that we are in this together, and our failure not just to recognize that, but to, street, to strategically deploy our resources with an understanding of what being interdependent as communities means. It, that's, that is absolutely critical to the success of this movement, which is why partnerships with organizations that have no relationship with the United Church of Christ is so critical. We need each other, and that has got to be at the core of our developing responses to the onset of Christian nationalism. And regarding fear, um, at my ordination, I had Buck Jones, who tells me that it was he who coined the phrase environmental racism. Others have taken credit for that. Um, um, and who worked as an activist and a UCC pastor in East St. Louis. He preached my ordination sermon and used the text from John's Gospel, if they hate you, know that they hated me first. And I think the only legitimate response as a Christian minister to the question you're asking about fear is there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And we do not grieve as those who have no hope. And we are two days past our high holy day celebration of Easter, which is the unfolding of a story of our belief in God's fundamental capacity to transform death into life. And it is only grounded in that that we can face the uncertainties of this time without fear. And let's remember that Christianity was birthed in the cauldron of an environment of fear. Their leader was hailed as an insurrectionist who was crucified by the emperor and the government of Rome. Believing that it had spoken the last word about a movement committed to peace only to discover that he lives and that the movement could not be eradicated. There's a group of reform, the, 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 I believe the first reform movement, the 11th century Waldensian movement, that has been a thorn in the side of the, the empire that is the Roman Catholic Church writ large um, and authors of the Doctrine of Discovery. And they have been trying to eradicate this little group from northern Italy founded by the son of a wealthy merchant named Peter Waldo who believed that the role of the Christian was simply to give money to the poor. And every time they thought they were wiped out, this group kept popping up. It is the re-articulation of what first generation Christianity was like this persecuted minority that had every reason to live in fear but continued to live in hope, believing that the power, the presence, and the movement of the Holy Spirit would preserve the proclamation of this good news to all the ends of the earth. 
and you can't shut it down. And it isn't dependent on our survival. This is an infinite game that continues long after we are gone. And the only question asked of us is what difference did you make while you were here? And finally, I'll quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer, friend of Reinhold Niebuhr, whom I must reference at least once while on campus, who said, in terms of your commitments to the movements for justice, and remember the context in which Dietrich spoke these words, when God calls you, God bids you come and die. And again, we do not grieve as those who have no hope, and we know that death will not have the last word. And so fear is antithetical to the, the story of the Christian faith. It makes perfect sense to be afraid of powers that have the, the capacity to control our lives. But our faith has meaning in its, in, a, in its ability to remind us that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. So we have a question back here, John. Yes. We have a question back here, and um, I hear grandchildren calling. Okay, so we'll let this be the last question. Thank you all for your patience. Um, hi, my name is Carol Ruda. Uh, I have a question about how organized religions are working together to combat and, and um, Christian nationalism, whether the UCC and or other, the Methodists, Presbyterians, Jewish communities, et cetera, Muslim, Muslim, Buddhists, um, we all share the same interest and not being squashed. And so what examples are, are and, and advocacy efforts actually at the state yeah. and federal level um, yeah. to combat Christian nationalism? Yeah. So I would say a number of things in response to that. There is an argument to be made that institutional religion is not and will not be the pathway through this. Because as was mentioned in one of the groups that I spoke with earlier on campus today. Um, many of our churches are populated with members across the theological and political spectrum. And speaking too overtly about this threatens the loss of not only members, but their contributions. And so there is an extent to which institutional religion is um, a, a silent complicitor in the rise of Christian nationalism. And I couldn't be prouder of the current leaders of, of uh, religious movements in America today who are finding their voice on this and who are speaking out to the, the, the members of their households of faith clearly and articulately about the rise of Christian nationalism as, as a threat to democracy. In terms of resources, um, the United Church of Christ still maintains an advocacy office in Washington, D.C. that does its work looking in two directions. One, it looks out at the membership of the United Church of Christ and on their behalf produces a daily list of legislative actions that would impact communities of faith one way or the other who are committed to the work of justice. And you can go on our website and track the work that they are doing. They also have a weekly newsletter that can be mailed to you that lists all of the current legislative actions that um, we are committed to. So there's that. They also have uh, not just that inward focus, they have an outward focus, and they are on the hill every day visiting with legislators and on our behalf, and now when I say a, I, I, our, I have to speak exclusively for a United Church of Christ, in the actions that we have taken by vote in General Synod advocating for human rights all over the place. And when a piece of legislative action gets written or presented that could impact that, they are on the hill representing our voices to the halls of Congress every day. And I couldn't be prouder of the work that they're doing. So John, one of our university uh, trustees Russ has asked, how many here are part of the United Church of Christ? Would you be willing to raise your hand so that he can see in there? Thank you. And that Russ also wanted to say, this is a part of the life of this institution. It's history. And it's tender, and it needs support, and it needs care and nurturing 
so that as you came in the sign, you saw above the door, all are welcomed, that all may be a part of. So will you, friends, we could keep talking. There's many more questions I know, but will you join me in thanking our distinguished guest, Dr. John Dorhauer, President and General Minister. If you're graduating this year, you have the treat of, as an undergraduate, the speaker of graduation who will get an honorary degree with this gentleman also is John Dorhauer and Russell Wiggins. Congratulations. Two things as you run out the door, please. I want you all to know that our beloved United Church of Christ Illinois Conference in Molly Carlson and Sarah did so much to help make this evening happen. Thank you and thank them, please, for all of you. And as you run out the door, this Sunday, back in the Frick Center Founders Lounge at seven o'clock, we will have our 33rd annual Yam HaShoah service that leads into the Holocaust lecture. If you have heard many things tonight, you hopefully will have heard the intersections of our life of faith and questions in society. Every year, this institution lifts up the questions of the Holocaust. Daniel Green is the head of the Newberry Library downtown. He will be our guest. It is going to be an important night. I invite you all to come out. Thank you all for coming. It's a joy to be a part of this life. Blessings and strength to you and go with grace. Amen.